Good to have everybody in here this morning. Good to have all of you. Let's pray and then we'll try to study the Bible a little bit. Father, give me the gift of teaching, Lord. And our Heavenly Father, I must decrease and you must increase. So, Lord, let them see you and not me. In thy holy name I pray. Amen. All right, if you turn to the book of uh, Exodus chapter 12, we'll talk about the Passover this morning because it's, uh, it's that time of the year in the Jewish calendar. I get that in one hand in the book of 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 in the other. And uh, you'll see how the Apostle Paul takes the Old Testament Jewish Passover and makes an application of it. Let's read 1 Corinthians 5, 7 first. The scripture says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that's the feast of unleavened bread, which follows the Passover, that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So the Apostle Paul took the Old Testament Passover and said very plainly, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of it because it was a type of Him. The Passover was a type of Christ. Now the word itself, Passover, is uh, where obviously that we get the, uh, the naming of the feast day, which is the uh, jewel, the crown jewel of all of the feast days of Israel, is the Passover. It's the beginning of the months. It's when God started cal counting on the calendar. If you'll notice that we start in Janus, which is the gatekeeper in pagan mythology, where we get the month January. And he's the gatekeeper, the keeper of the keys. Janus is the one who opens the, the year, opens the new year. So uh, when we have January on our calendar, that's exactly where it came from. But when God says, I want you to count time, you don't count it from January, the beginning of the year. You count it from spring, March, April. That's the beginning of months. And the, uh, the term, the, uh, uh, the first word for it, first word used to describe it was Abib, the month Abib. They changed some of the names of the months of the year, the Jews did, after they had been infiltrated or corrupted by uh, pagan mythology. They changed the names of Tammuz and so forth from Babylonian foolishness. But the original names that God gave them are the ones that are important because they're very instructive. The word abib means a, 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 a busting forth from the bud. It means a blooming forth. It's, it's, coming, it's a giving of life. And so the month abib would, would stand to reason would be the beginning of the months or the beginning of life. And so therefore Passover is associated with that because it is the beginning of life. It is when God redeemed them with a long outstretched arm from 400 years of Egyptian bondage. And of course he did that uh, in the book of Exodus chapter number 12. So the Passover is a memorial that is to be kept from generation to generation to generation. And as you know, the Jews today still keep the Passover. And uh, they still keep it because it is a memorial. It's in, to be kept in immemorium. There's no end to it until the coming of the Messiah. Now, of course, we know there's a problem with that, don't we? We know the Messiah, Messiah has come. He came 2,000 years ago. And they were blind to him. And this is why the Apostle Paul says, Christ is our Passover, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. He's our Passover, and he's everything that the Passover represents. And believe me, the Passover represents a lot. There's a lot involved in the Jewish Passover. But I want to remind you this morning what a great debt we have to the Jewish people. You do not owe the pagan a thing. He didn't give you anything. Now, when I say owe, oh, I'm talking about we did not derive anything in our faith. We received nothing from them. They are not the channel of truth. The truth came through the Jew because he's the, he has the oracles of God, Romans chapter number 9. And God told Moses to write a book. And the book that he told him to write, of course, is the Holy Bible. And he wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. So we are indebted greatly to the Jew, if you'll notice, that does not say that Christ is our, uh, uh, for example, Hajj. Do you know what a Hajj is? Every devout Muslim, at least one time in his lifetime, will make a trip to Mecca in Saudi Arabia. 
And he feels incumbent upon him to make that trip to Mecca as a pilgrim. And of course, Mecca is where the Kaaba stone is located. I don't know if you've ever noticed. Have you ever seen a, a, a video of tens of thousands of people marching around a square at Mecca? And in and the center of that square is a black Kaaba stone. They make a pilgrimage at least one time in their lifetime to, uh, to, that, to that place in Mecca. The two, two of the holiest sites in Islam are Mecca, Medina, and then they claim Jerusalem. The problem with claiming Jerusalem as a holy site in Islam is that it is never mentioned one time in the Quran, Not one time. And of course you'd think if it was such a holy site it'd be in there, wouldn't you? But in any event, we owe the Jew for the Passover. And we owe the Jew for the oracles of God. And we are indebted to the Jew for the Mashiach, the Messiah. For he came through the Jew. Of what tribe? Judah. And that's what it says in Revelation chapter number 4. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5.5, 5, I think it is, hath prevailed from the tribe of Judah. <clears throat> so the Jewish Passover <clears throat> is definitely a feast day, but it's, it's associated with deliverance and redemption. And this is why it's so important, because take, for example, the Feast of Lights, Hanukkah. How many of you know that the Feast of Hanukkah is a Jewish feast? And I'm sure that you see it advertised sometimes around Christmas time. And Hanukkah is not found in the Bible. It's not one of the original feast days given in the book of Leviticus. But it's not, I'm not saying that it is unscriptural. Because Hanukkah is something that is taken from the book of Maccabees, where Israel uh, had, uh, they, they cleansed the temple from Antiochus Epiphanes. And when they did, they purged it, cleansed it, and God gave them oil enough to burn for eight days when they only had enough to burn for just a few hours. But it burned for eight days. And so therefore it's called the Feast of Lights. And then you have the Feast of Purim. Pur, from the Hebrew word pur, which means a lot. That's what the Hebrew word means. How many know what the Feast of Purim, Purim is associated with? Yeah, what is it? Well, there was a battle involved. It certainly was. It was when they tried to wipe them out as a race. It's a pogrom, like Hitler. Hitler involved himself in a pogrom, P-O-G-R-A-M. A pogrom is when you try to wipe from the face of the earth an entire race of people. It's a racial thing. It's, it's, uh, it, uh, uh, how many of you remember the name Vashti? A All right, now you know where we're headed, don't you? Exactly. In the book of Esther, that's where the, that's where the Purim came from. And uh, it was there that God uh, delivered his people through Mordecai and through Hadassah. Now, her name is Esther, but it's like when you change the names, you know, uh, Belteshazzar. Who was that? That's Daniel, exactly. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's nothing wrong with using those names, but it's good to know the Hebrew name because that's their God-given name. The other name is a pagan name given to change their identity. So we have other feast days that have been added. We have the Feast of, of Unleavened Bread that follows the Passover. Then 50 days later, you have the feast that shows up in the book of Acts chapter number 2. On the day of when the Holy Spirit came down, cloven tongues like as a fire. 120 had been in the upper room. The Bible said they began to speak the word of God. They spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Over 16 different people, nationalities were present. Every man heard in his own language the wonderful works of God. What feast was that? No, it was 50 days after Passover. What is it? Pentecost. Pente. Pentagram. What's a pentagram? It's a five-pointed star. See? When, when uh, Intel came out with its, uh, its uh, processor, it called it a Pentium. Remember that? The Pentium processor. Five. So that feast day is, is uh, ordained in the book of Leviticus. And then you have the seventh month, the tenth day of the month, which is the most holy day in Israel's calendar. And it's that day when the high priest can go into the Holy of Holies. And there he can offer up a uh, sacrifice for the people. And either God accepts or rejects it. What day is that? Israel was attacked on that day. Yom Kippur. Yom in Hebrew's year and Kippur is atonement. And it's associated with kafir. 
And when the Bible says that Noah made that ark, he covered it with pitch. Well, literally, he kafered it. That's what that word, that's what it means. He covers. That's what atonement means, a covering. And the word kafer is used there. So he covered that ark. It was covered with the atonement. Therefore, it floated on top of the water, you see. And so the tenth day of the month, the seventh month, but also in that same month, you have the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles is very important because Israel comes together, makes booths, come in there, and they remember that they were strangers in the land of Israel, and God has given them a place to tabernacle, a place to wait until the Day of Atonement, when the Day of Atonement comes, when the great high priest shows up. And who's the great high priest? The Lord Jesus. This is what makes a lot of people believe that the Feast of Tabernacles will be the time of the second advent, when the Lord Jesus comes back and appears to the children of Israel and appears as he is. And they'll want to know where he got these nail prints in his hands. <clears throat> you see the, you, the two terms called the rapture and the revelation. The rapture when he catches up the bride, that's in secret. But the revelation is when he reveals himself. And the first one he reveals himself to is the Jew. Why? He has a personal bone to pick <laughs> with the Jew. Why? That's part of the family. Yeah. That's right. That's part of the family. It wouldn't surprise me one bit if Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea and Joel and Amos, Nobadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, all the prophets showed up with him and speak to them and say, we told you, we told you, this is the one, we told you. And so he'll, he'll have a controversy with Zion when he meets with them face to face. Folks, don't ever forget the fact that he loves the Jew. The oracles of God. So in the book of Exodus, we have a lamb that is offers a sacrifice. We have the most powerful nation on earth, Egypt, Pharaoh, who, who, uh, who, is, uh, who has taken these, who has, you know how they went into, into Egypt. You know they went into Egypt because they were hungry. Joseph was the uh, second only in command to the Pharaoh. They went in on good terms, and because Joseph was so close to the Pharaoh, they were allowed to live in, to, they, they settled in their own area, which was called Goshen. And uh, when these judgments eventually showed up later on, it was G Goshen that was spared from the judgments. But Israel, they, they profited, they, they, they proliferated, they increased in number. God blessed them as he, as he has. And, uh, and then the, that Pharaoh died and another Pharaoh rose up who did not know Joseph and began to enslave them. And so for 400 years, they had been away from their land. And God now had sent a deliverer and had called him in the land of Midian. How many of you remember the circumstances surrounding the call of this man? What was his name and where was the call? His name was Moses. Where did God call him? I know, but there was a, he's associated with an event. It's something you'll never forget. The bush that burned and was not consumed. The bush that burned and was not consumed. That's when he called him and said, I want you to go and deliver my people. And uh, Moses wasn't a young man. Moses' life can be broken down in three distinct groups, three distinct periods of time. He was 40 years old when he left Egypt, 40. And the scripture says in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter number 11, <coughs> when, he was, when he came of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And so at 40, he was uh, essentially driven from his people. They didn't accept him. He thought they would accept him as their deliverer. And so they didn't. And so... He went off into the land of Midian. He met Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he fits in the category of Melchizedek. The priest of Midian is kind of like Melchizedek because a priest of what? What God? Who did he know? Who did he represent? You see, he was a priest. And Melchizedek, of course, we know was the priest of the Most High God. And he met Abraham when he came back from the slaughter of the kings. So when, Ab when, when Moses was 80 years old, 80, that's the time men retire. If they live that long, that's when he got his call. <laughs> and so for another how many years? Forty. Forty. How old was Moses when God took him? He was 120. And the Bible said his sight hadn't abated. He had his strength, all of that. At 120, he was the same as a 40-year-old man. Why? Because God blessed him, that's why. The hand of God was upon him. So in Exodus chapter number 12, they're going to be delivered. Now, God could have delivered them by power. 
He's Almighty God. He can, if He can split the Red Sea and He can rain manna from heaven, if He can walk on the water, He can do anything. But the nature of God causes Him to do it a certain way, a certain way. And He's going to redeem them from Egyptian bondage, but He's going to use blood. He's going to use the blood of the Lamb. He's going to use blood. And He's going to teach them a lesson here in redemption that they'll never forget. That this blood is associated with redemption, cleansing, and protection. Because when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The blood over the doorpost and lentils. The blood was not placed upon the threshold. In Hebrews it says plainly, when they have trodden underfoot the blood of the Son of God. You don't trodden His blood under your feet. Down there in Florida, when that professor told that a student to write the name of Jesus on a piece of paper and put it on the floor and stomp on it. How many of you knew that? Didn't know that? A professor, so-called professor. You know, this bunch that is so sensitive, they don't want to offend anybody. You know, Easter eggs are now uh, spring eggs. Easter is now spring. They, they, they want to rip Christ and, and everything from the public square. And now they've taken the next step. They want you to publicly humiliate your faith and belief in Him? Well, the Governor Scott of Florida, to his credit, has launched an investigation into it, and that professor has been suspended from Florida, Florida State, Florida University, Florida something, Florida Gulf, whatever it is down there, one of the, one of the schools in Florida. He's been temporarily suspended until a full, uh, a full in, uh, investigation has been, uh, has been made in this uh, uh, event, and it's good. And let me tell you why it's good. Because if they win the victory in Florida, they may win it somewhere else and slow the tide, slow this thing down. It's, it's un Folks, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see where they're headed. They use your freedoms to take your freedom. I'm going to get to preaching here in a minute. I'm going to, have to, I'm going to have to quit and get back to studying. But they do. They do. They're the biggest hypocrites that ever walked the face of the earth. They talk about freedom. They talk about, uh, what's that word, uh, 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 where, you, where you embrace everything, liberal em embracing. You know, don't offend anybody. And then turn right around and rip the very soul out of what you believe. Can't you see the hypocrisy? You can't believe this bunch. Don't believe a thing they say. From the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. They, there's no soundness in them. They're nothing but liars and deceivers. Amen. I'm glad I got rid of that. Hallelujah. <laughs> so let's go to Exodus 12. <laughs> in Exodus 12, the Bible said, The Lord spake to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be to you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, I want you to notice in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 31 and verse number 5. Isaiah chapter 31 and verse number five. Isaiah 31, five. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it. And passing over, he will preserve it. The idea is that uh, that we commonly hold is that the the death that uh, that the death angel passed over the house. But from if you look a little closer into the scripture, you you begin to get the idea. Well, maybe there was the death angel came to the house, but there was one hovering over the house because of that blood that drove the destroyer away. In other words, pass over doesn't necessarily mean to come and go. It means to stay there to defend and protect the home. And uh, if you'll notice that every home was marked. And the reason for this is because God was teaching them something about the sovereignty of the individual house. God could have gathered Israel together as a group and protected, defended them, and delivered them. He didn't. He delivered them individually, but He delivered them as a household unit. That's important because God makes a big deal in the Old Testament about the household or the home. 
If you want to destroy a culture, you destroy the home. When you've done that, you've destroyed it. It'll make a difference how many gadgets you have to play with and how much money you have in the bank. Just don't put it at Cyprus. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm talking about. If he can destroy the home, he will destroy the motivation of the man to go to work. He'll destroy motherhood, fatherhood, the children to obey their parents. It'll have a great deal to go toward stopping 17-year-old boys with a 22, auto, a 22 long rifle shooting a little child in the face with no compunction, no feeling, as if he shot a bag of salt, he murdered a little baby. Folks, there's something bad, bad, bad wrong. And instead of an ignorant government going after guns, they ought to start dealing with the destruction of this nation. What's causing the corruption of this country? There's something bad wrong when a 17-year-old boy has no more feelings for a little infant child, a 13-month-old baby in a, in, a, in a little stroller than to just shoot it to death. So the individual home is singled out. That means fatherhood, motherhood, the children. That means what makes a home. The definitions that we have as aunt and uncle, mother, father, son, daughter, the relationship that we have with each other as mothers and fathers and sons and daughters and aunts and uncles and cousins and so forth. You know where that comes from? That comes from the Old Testament. And then it's, and then it's built upon in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul and the teachings of the, of, the, of the New Testament epistles, they in no way change anything as it's set forth in the Old Testament about the structure of the home. And you show me a child that has no home, and I'll show you a child with no anchor and no direction and no understanding. And they don't know where they fit. They don't know what they are. They say so many times, I've heard them say on television, that the gangbangers recruit the kids that don't have homes. And they're looking for identity and somebody that will accept them and love them. And the gangbangers give them identity and a place to go to. Government, listen to that. And where does it start? It starts in the home. So homes were delivered from Egypt. Think about that. Think about that. Homes were delivered. Yes, sir. They kept it up to see if it had any blemishes or would develop. And they all had to take part in the uh, marking of the animals in the sideboard. But they had to come fresh to that. Yes, it did. They had to know it. Yes. That's the point. If it was in the whole family house, or if a neighbor didn't handle it, they could share it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. It wasn't an anonymous thing, something brought to them by somebody else. It was their lamb. Exactly. Sure. Yeah, the, the identity. You identify with the Lord Jesus. You identify with him carrying your sins to the cross. You identify him dying in your place. You identify him with suffering the vengeance of God, the wrath of God. Then you identify with him as he was raised from the dead. When he was raised from the dead, the Bible said he was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. A declaration went forth. As you absolutely do identify. You get to know that lamb. So the uh, Passover therefore, becomes a salvation of homes. Homes. Say, preacher, what if an Egyptian had watched them do that, asked them the question, said, well, can I? They could have. He did not forbid the Egyptian from killing a lamb and putting it over the doorpost and lintels. No, sir. That blood was what he was looking for. He didn't care whose identity was inside the house. He was looking for the blood. He said, when I see the Israelites, I will pass over you. Did I mess up? When I see their sincerity, I'll pass over you. When I fully understand their religion, I'll pass over you. What do he say? When I see what? The blood. The blood. Yes, sir. <laughs> They show up later on, so that's a good point, and they may very well have, yeah. Because it does say there was a mixed multitude. And no, they weren't all Jews. Uh, 
And so uh, there's, you can't, just because the Bible doesn't say specifically they did, it doesn't mean they didn't. So, pardon? Uh-huh. Uh, oh, you're talking about which Joseph? Oh, you're talking about Joseph that went down into Egypt, son of Jacob. The, uh, the, uh, the, 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 yeah, uh, uh, Rachel's, Rachel was his mother. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, he, he married, uh, uh, what was her name? Uh, Ash, uh. I can't remember her name. Uh, it's hard to remember all the names. There's a bunch of names in the Bible, but, but he, her, her father was a priest. He was the priest of On. I know that. All right. Now, uh, so this is, it's, I want to emphasize this. It was a household salvation. It was a household. The children didn't put the blood on the doorpost, but the children benefited from the blood being on the doorpost. If you're born into a Christian home, then there's great benefit in being born in the Christian home. If you're born into the home of a prostitute and a crack house, there's, you know, you're, going to pay, you're going to pay a price for that. Exactly. But if you're born into a Christian home, and back in the 50s and 40s and 30s, uh, a lot of people were born into Christian homes. And many of you in this house this morning can testify that your mother or your father or both your mother and your father or your grandmother and your grandfather also were dedicated Christians. You ought to shout and praise God because of your heritage the fact that you were. All right, I've made that point, and here's why I make that point. I want you to, uh, I want you to look at something with me. Look at the book of uh, uh, Exodus chapter number 19 and verse number 6. Exodus 19, 6. Now look at what he says. Now notice. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of what? Priest and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. A kingdom of priests, all right? Who's the priest? The father. He holds the position title of priest. Now remember, when they were delivered from Egyptian bondage, did they have an Aaronic priesthood then? And who was Aaron? Moses' brother. All right, and Aaron, of course, became the first great high priest. The tribes of Levi produced the priest followed. All right, so now we have a priesthood instituted when they, were in the, were in the, when they were in the Sinai. But before that, blood had to be applied. So who applied the blood? Well, the father did. Now, I would think so. He took hyssop, a, a bush, brush that grows in that area, and he took that hyssop and he put the blood over the doorpost and over the lintel. Therefore, he was doing what a priest does. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ went to glory, the Bible said he did not enter in with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood he entered in. In the Holy of Holies, the, the closest thing to God, the most sacred thing they had was the Ark of the Covenant. And who sprinkled blood on that? The high priest did. All right. So what we've done, we've established a priesthood before Aaron. And this doesn't in any way take away from Aaron's priesthood, but it shows you that we have already now three priests before Aaron ever shows up. Melchizedek, Jethro, and now we have the priest of the home, right? The father that, 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 puts, that applies the priest. You see how the priesthood thing now that God begins to use it in the Bible because he'll develop it later on in the scripture. Look at this over here in the book of Isaiah chapter number 61 and verse 6. Now, the scripture says, But ye shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. Now, has that happened? No. What do you mean? Well, has Aaron ever been a priest to the Gentile? No. He never has been. The, a Gentile proselyte in the, Old Test or in the New Testament, Old Testament proselyte, was a Gentile that was allowed to get so close into the court of the Gentiles in the temple, but he could not go further. And uh, only a Jew was allowed to do that. So the priest, the, the Levitical priesthood, was limited in its ministry 
Have I run out of time already? No. 10.30. The Levitical priesthood ha was limited in its ministry, you see. And it was, it, was a, it was a ministry that ministered to the nation of Israel as a people. Now, don't you think about this for a minute. Israel's identity came in a lot of different ways. Number one, I'm an Israelite. All right, I've been born. I belong to one of the 12 tribes. See, I'm the tribe of Benjamin. I'm an Israelite. All right. On top of that, though, I have a priesthood. That priesthood allows me to approach God. See, I have a priesthood. I can, I can come and bring a sacrifice and approach into God. That's an identity. The Passover feast give me this continuing constant identity year after year after year where I identify with this. this is what I am this is what I do okay but when the Lord Jesus Christ at the Passover now you can argue from here to the Lord comes back about which day he was crucified on I choose Wednesday a lot of folks choose Friday call it Good Friday and all that that's up to you but when he gathered together and had that Lord's Supper in the upper room remember that all right. He was celebrating, they thought, they thought he was celebrating the Passover, you see. And in a way he was because he is our Passover, remember? But he took all the elements of the Passover. He took the national identity. He took the feast days. He took the priesthood. And every bit of it became centered in one man. From that moment on, it was no longer a date a place, an identity, it was a person. You see what happened? That's what he did. From changing from the, pass, the Jewish Passover where there is nothing wrong with whatsoever, that's God ordained and instituted, but Christ became the Passover. Just like in the book of Hebrews, chapter number four, when it talks about a rest, which is the, which is the seventh day, Shabbat in Hebrew means rest, well, that was a day. That was an event. Now it is a person. Christ is our rest. You see how it's going? You see how all these Old Testament things that related to Israel's identity, something they did, something, some place they, they went to or what have you, all of them now have become a person. The resurrection was an event. Now it's a person. When God said, Ezekiel, can these bones live? <laughs> Lord, you know. <laughs> what happened? He said, prophesy to the wind. And so he did. And you know what happened. All right. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, I am the resurrection. And that's the way it goes. And there's more. I mean, that's just a few illustrations to give you an idea of what's going on here. You see how the Old Testament is fulfilled Every jot, every tittle, every promise, yes. every aspiration, everything it ever hoped to be in one person. Right. So what does that mean? Well, that means then, therefore, if Christ is the fulfillment of all of that Old Testament, then why in the world would I want to go drag up something and start trying to have that as some kind of a holy thing yeah. and practice it and try to add to what He is? And that, of course, brings us to this one. Now, look over here in 1 Peter, chapter number 2. Now, we've looked at this priesthood. And you can see how that God uh, declares a priest. Uh, for example, while you're looking, you know that the College of Cardinals just met over there in Rome. You know that. And uh, I think it was 115, 107, something like that. Cardinals. All right. Now, uh, how many of you know what the word cardinal means? They didn't just reach up and pull it out of the thin air and say, that sounds good. They're going to wear red and we're going to call them cardinals. You know what the word means? It's a door opener. Doorkeeper. It's the keeper of the door. You know what a street in Latin is called? A cardo. Do you know what you get in outside when you get ready to leave here? A car. A car that runs on a cardo. That's, I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. <laughs> A cardo maximus in Latin is the main street, okay? And that's the way they laid out. If, it's amazing if you do a little research into the Roman system of things. When they, let, when they take a city, they, they, they remake it into Rome, a, little, a small Rome. And they have a cardo maximus. They have image of their gods. 
and they have all the rest of it that goes with it, and they have the Pax Romana, which is the peace of Rome, so forth and so on, all that. So a cardinal is one who is a gatekeeper that opens the door. All of this comes from Roman history, mythology, tradition, the rest of it. Vestal virgins, for example, vestal virgins, who were attending the Pontifus Maximus. What is Pontifus? Maximus. Maximus means great, you know. Maximum, we get in the Hebrew, what's maximum mean in English? See how the words come over? So a Pontifus Maximus is a great father because that's what the word Pontifus, Pontifus means. Pont, uh, pontificate, that means the fatherhood of. The Pope is, a, is the pontificate, it's his, his pontificate, it's his fatherhood. It's his reigning as the Pope, all right? So when they come over with this and they, the, the Pontifus Maximus is the great father, all right? So the Cardinal is the one who opens the door. He's the doorkeeper. What's that mean? That means he's the doorkeeper to eternal life. He's the one who opens the door for your salvation. He's the one who opens and no man op shuts and shuts and no man opens. And so from their number, from the 115, whatever they are, they come together in what's called an enclave. And they meet in the Sistine Chapel, which Michelangelo drew all that on overhead. They meet in the Sistine. That's beautiful art, by the way. Beautiful stuff. <laughs> Making a difference where it is. Beauty's beauty. But they meet in that Sistine Chapel, and they meet in there. And from their number, from their number, they choose the successor to sit on St. Peter's chair, the chair of St. Peter. The chair is the seat of authority. And so he sits on that chair. And so they've just chosen one, and his name is Francis. And he is the first one, that I, my understanding, he's the first one that is a Jesuit. And what's a Jesuit? Where did they come? What, what is a Jesuit? They're the teachers. They're the intelligentsia. They're the thinkers. I got on a Catholic website the other day. This girl lives out in West, and she's an, an, an investment advisor. She despises this latest pope. That's instructive because it lets you know that there's a lot of dissension in the Roman Catholic Church. They let you think on the surface that everything is hunky-dory, but they're just like the rest of us. They've got a lot of dogfighting going in. Amen. Fighting for power and what have you. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of complaint going on right now about this present pope when he kissed the feet of those and washed their feet and kissed them, and, when he, and, and some of the traditional things that he has, he has removed some of the tradition that uh, Pope Benedict, the, the his predecessor, had brought back to the Catholic Church. So the cardinal is one who opens the door. From their number comes the pope, and he is the successor of Peter. He becomes the head of the church. The apostolic church, that's what they call themselves. Why apostolic? Because it goes back to the apostles. It goes back to the beginning. There is, no, there is no predecessor to them. They are it. Pope Linus, and his name is mentioned if this is, I'm not saying this is the same Linus, but his name is mentioned. I forget now. Peter, I think it's in Peter or Timothy. Maybe Timothy, I forget. I was reading it the other day. Linus, L-I-N-U-S, he's supposed to be the first, pre, the first successor of Peter. Peter was the first pope, then Linus, and then the whole line that goes back, okay? So I said all that to say this, that, that, that according to them, the priesthood has been ordained and established in their church. And their priesthood, according to their teaching, is their, uh, their ordained priests who are ordained by the College of Cardinals through the pope, through the curia, through the, through the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Here's the problem with that. First Peter talks about a priesthood. Okay, now look at this priesthood Peter's talking about. Chapter number 2 and verse number 5. Here's the apostle. 1 Peter 2, 5. Now notice carefully. Who's, told, who's saying this? You remember? Simon Peter. You remember? Okay. Cephas. The word Cephas. Called him Cephas. The word Cephas means a stone. Simon Peter's doing the talking. What's Peter talking about? What in the text? A priesthood. Now you're getting this. Put it together. Put, put, put it together in your mind. If this man, Peter, is talking about a priesthood, and he's, and he's talking to the believers, and this is what's called one of these general epistles, pastoral epistles, it's general epistle. It's not addressed to a church, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. If he's saying that you individual believers are priests, okay, look at it. Now, let's, I'm probably jumping too much. Ye also as lively stone built upon a spiritual house and holy priesthood, 
to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Verse 9, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness to his marvelous light. Now, who's he talking to? Talking to real believers like us, right? Okay. Do you get the idea that he is addressing all of them the same way? All right. If they're all being addressed in the same sense, they are all priests, right? And who's doing the talking? The first pope. Right? I said that tongue in cheek. I don't. But I'm trying to show you. I'm trying to show you where this is coming from. You see what I mean? I'm not, I'm not up here this morning to denigrate the Pope. God knows I'm not. I'm not. I, Lord knows I've I got enough to worry about with me. I'm not. My responsibility as a pastor is to give you the truth. I want you to get the truth, folks. No man, if I can understand my Bible correctly, can exercise authority over you as a priest. No man. No man. You have a priesthood. And what I tried to show you beforehand in the Old Testament was to show you how that even before there was a sacrificial tabernacle, a temple, a Levitical priesthood and all that, that a priesthood existed. And that when Israel was delivered out of Egyptian bondage, that blood was applied. The blood was, was applied by the father of the house, we assume. And because of his priesthood, then we see that a priesthood existed in the mind of God by establishing the individual priesthood, how that's carried over into the New Testament as, as because we as believers, every one of us, can offer up sacrifices to God. Now, should I take a lamb out here and kill it? What good would that do? Uh, if you've ever had leg of lamb, I'm sure, you know, obviously, I've, had, I've been to Ireland. I had mutton for the first time over there. It's unique. It's a different meal. Uh, it's something that you could probably learn to enjoy pretty good. You know, that's sheep, all that. Take New Zealand, for example. That's loaded with sheep and all that. But the point is, we offer up sacrifices to God, every one of us. And the sacrifices that we offer up to the Lord are not a physical visible thing. What does it call our sacrifices? Yeah, well, I mean spiritual sacrifices, however they fit in the category. Spiritual sacrifices. Now, why then, you, you force yourself to ask this question, and I've run out of time, but I'll ask it before I quit. Why would you want to offer a physical sacrifice? See, think on that, and we'll pick it up next week. That's your body. Why would you hold something in your hand and try to turn it into the body of Christ? Yeah. Why would you want to do it? Well, you see, you're getting into something. You're getting into the method. You're getting into the liturgy, the, 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 the methodology of a priesthood, but it's a contrived priesthood. So you have to have, why, 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 why? That always eats me up. Why are you doing that? What does that mean? And you've got to ask yourself that question. Why would they take a cup and turn it into the blood of Christ? Pardon? They're doing something the rest of the people can't, right? That's one element of it. Absolutely. It is one element of it. It certainly is. Sir? It is a carnal ordinance. It is a cardinal ordinance. The Bible said he offered one sacrifice for sin forever and sat down at the right hand of God. He finished the work. Yes, sir. Okay, I've seen them. Called a satino. Well, it's a hierarchy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The idea is, I think, if you want to look at it this way, that that pagan cultures have an element of the truth, but it's darkened, and it's the point of the church to take that element of the truth, and and manifest it. 
develop it so that, they'll, so that the rest of the world will understand. Yes, God did reveal Himself to the pagan. He did reveal Himself, and they understand certain things, and blah, blah, blah. That's a problem. The problem is that this is the source of the truth. This is the source of the truth. Anything that the pagan has that, that has that has elements of the truth, and they do, that has elements of the truth, they had got it from here, then they darkened it because they didn't have the Holy Spirit to continue to teach them and lead them into all truth. That's why it's so necessary for the Holy Ghost. We'll have word of prayer and we'll let you go. Brother Lee dismisses, please.